welcome to the roast of Pat Fable. <laughs> so I'm, I'm tasked with introducing the legend Pat Fable. And uh, the best way I can think to do it is, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm very excited about this summer. Uh, I get to travel to Italy and play some music. And the real reason I'm going to Italy to play music this summer is because of this man and his influence on me uh, back in the 80s. So, as the story goes, I was in the music trader looking for uh, just, you know, some music of the day, some Agent Orange records, Pretenders, whatever, new wave punk music, and uh, Pet. We all, all know uh, Pat from working there for, for many years and being the, uh, the music guru that he was. And uh, so I'm flipping through the bins and uh, you know, I keep, keep hearing this music and it's, it's kind of, I don't know if bugging me is the right, it's, no, it wasn't bugging me, but it was, it was like infecting me, I guess would be the, the right term. And, I just couldn't stop thinking about what I was hearing. And so finally, I, 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 I grew some and walked up to Pat and said, what are we listening to? And uh, so we were, we, this is true. <laughs> so we, we were listening to a band called The Astronauts, uh, a, a surf band uh, from the 60s out of Colorado. Uh, playing this incredible surf music, and you know, at the time, I really hadn't, uh, didn't really have a real understanding of what surf music was. And uh, so, Pat, you know, uh, always happy to tell a story and share his knowledge, uh, tell me what we were listening to, and and I was just kind of blown away by what I was hearing. And, and Pat happened to mention that he he actually played in a played this kind of music, played in a band. I was like, oh, really? I love to come hear you guys play. Sometime he's like, well, the problem is we don't have a drummer right now. And I was like, <laughs> I'm a drummer. Let's do this. So uh, that was, uh, I mean, I knew Pat before this meeting, but uh, this is where Pat, Pat and I, you know, cemented a, a lifelong friendship. And um, so we, uh, you know, went up to Braddock Heights and, uh, you know, Got the, got the band going. At the time, we were called the Drag Tones, and uh, we were playing a combination of surf music and uh, drag, drag racing music, you know, songs about hot rods and racing them. And they dressed like girls. <laughs> <laughs> that thing <being> later. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that was, that was my introduction to playing surf music with Pat, and, uh, you know, that was just... Uh, just, it just started a whole lifetime of memories for me. Um, getting to travel and uh, meeting some incredible musicians over the years. And, um, you know, I just really, really, really owe a lot to Pat. And, um, you know, we, we went through a bunch of bands together. Um, you know, early on, you know, after the, the whole drag tones thing, um, you know, Pat was watching uh, this movie with Killers from Space in 1954. Uh, sci-fi uh, with Peter Graves, uh, so he, he was influenced by that, so he um, changed the name to Killers from Space, um, kind of started developing maybe a little theorier of the sound, uh, then we went through some more, more lineup changes, uh, different bands, we got into some, some, some rockabilly, some some old country, some, uh, some, some 70s truck driving songs, uh, 18 wheeler music, and uh, but we always kind of came back to, back to the surf music thing. And, uh, and uh, so after uh, Pat started his, uh, his listening career and moved away, you know, just kind of stuck with me. And uh, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, just really cherished those years. And I, I thought, you know, uh, between Pat and uh, Dennis Crawley, who's here, I think some really great songs were written uh, right here in Frederick County. And, uh, you know, I wanted to honor that, so I was like, like well, I can't, 
I can't get the old band back together uh, for, for various reasons, and I'm just a drummer, so fuck it, I'm going to learn how to play guitar, and I'm going to learn these songs and get a band back together and, and, and just honor the past, and, and holy shit, just from doing that, go new. You know, I was kind of a, like, of that age where you know I was you know younger than Pat, but you know we always looked up to you know everybody's younger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there, there was this older crew that you know we, we we looked up to, we were a little scared of, looked up to, and. and uh, you know, so it's, it's really great to be a part of it. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, yeah, exactly, legend. And, and uh, you know, what was kind of interesting, you know, for me is, you know, at the time, you know, a lot of my friends, you know, kind of getting into the early '90s, all my friends were, you know, listening to, uh, you know, grunge and, you know, what was popular then. And, you know, no, but uh, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, it's got me listening to, to Buck Owens, you know, like. <laughs> And then just all the stuff that goes along with it, um, you know, the cramps, Buck Owens, uh, just, you know, just, you know, that's kind of what, you know, the spirit of this evening is, is just, you know, uh, celebrating uh, being a, a misfit, uh, celebrating uh, not being part of the mainstream, and, um, and you know, it was kind of ironic, because I thought I was part of the... Uh, you know, the, the, the counterculture, you know, listening to punk records, but then, you know, when, when all your friends start listening to, you know, they gravitate, well, back then, uh, we were listening to punk records, then, then everyone started kind of listening to, like, The Dead and Bob Marley, and that wasn't really my thing, and that's when I started playing music with Pat, and then, uh, then those same people, you know, like, those grunge, and, um, you know, just told me, kind of, Culture with the counterculture. Um, and anyway, I'm rambling now, so. I love you, man. Oh, we love you. Um, <laughs> give him a kiss! Yeah! Let's go! Give him a kiss! 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 Give in Frederick, I mean, absolute legend. And you know, when I when I think of Pat Fable, this is kind of a you know, you know you're a redneck. Uh, anyway, uh, when, when, when I think of Pat Fable, I hope this sticks. You know, people start saying, you know, when I think of Pat Fable, I, I think of Denny's at 2 a.m. I think of uh, some really freaking. Cool, weird, dressed in all black, scary, Pat Fable. <laughs> Just yeah. you know, too cool for the record. Uh, yeah, you know, million, million Pat Fable stories, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at Denny's because, I mean, I think you can all relate to seeing Pat there. <laughs> Anyway, how uh, the bass player from Thrillsville is taking over. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Woo! I have you guys know that Craig and I sent our first hot dog into orbit. True story. <laughs> My recollections of Pat, I remember I was 18 years old, and somebody said, we're going up to Braddock Heights, and I entered the laboratory, the basement, where we create, and yeah, mad scientists are music, so talk to me, Pat, about your early influence. Um, a whole lot of things, I mean... My brother was 10 years older than I was, so I grew up in the middle of the British 
I remember where I was in the house on the Beatles play and it's all right. I don't, you know, it's like I was three months old, four months old, but I remember the room I was in. I remember the excitement of that. And I grew up listening to Beatles and Stones and Kinks and all of that just sort of washed over me. Because you're multiple genre. <laughs> you are. You're surf. You're psychedelic. You're punk. You are. You are encompassing all things. What? What? What leads you to that? Uh, there've been, you know, little bits of it that have, you know, like I was in the hall, and I think it's trying to reconcile, you know, all these little bits that have gone into it into. <laughs> what I hear in my head is my own thing. And there are little bits of all of that in it. You know, it's like I hope that all of you guys with the stuff that we're doing, you can at least hear the little bits of that coming out. But I mean, there's like, certainly the British invasion, certainly, you know, 1967, I was, you know, what, three and a half years old. <laughs> And to me, when I heard Piper at the Gates of Dawn, or their Satanic Majesty's request, I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> this is like, this is what the world is supposed to be. And everything made perfect sense to me. It's one of the few times in my life I felt at the right place at the right time, and everything made sense. You know, I would listen to the music. And the reason, you know, my brother, would get the records, you know, he was an avid record player, and he started getting all the psychedelic stuff, and it didn't really make sense to him, in the same way, like, you know, he was used to the Beatles, kind of straight rock stuff, and he was used to the Kings, and when that stuff came out, it was a little bit too weird <laughs> So he's like, you like it? Here, you, you have it. And he gave me, you know, those records. But they made perfect sense to me. Like, if you listen to something like Piper of the Gates of Dawn, it's almost like a nursery. You know, like the, the stories, the, the way that Sid Barrett would put songs together. So for a kid, you know, it's like, it made perfect sense. It's just like these really wonderful little songs that he put together. So the whole psychedelic thing, I completely got into. But it wasn't until probably late, very late 60s, 1970, 1971, when the first time I saw something that I could start playing as my own, and I saw, I, I remember being in a department store with my mom. Shop. And Lou Reed's Walk on the Wild Side comes over the, you know, just over the store, you know, sort of like sound system. And I picked up on what was going on in the song. You know, it's like, it, you know, it was only, I don't know, whatever, seven years old. But even I knew what giving head was. And I was just like, just in awe. It's like there's this completely just passionate sort of deadpan, like coolest persona that you can imagine with just this voice, with this command and this presence, you know, and telling you this wonderful narrative. And I was able to sort of follow it in my head. I got an idea of what he was talking about. And I was looking around at all of these middle-aged housewives going about their shopping. You know, and I was just like, looking around like, what? It's like, you didn't hear that? Like, even I knew what was going on with it. And the same thing with uh, probably Bowie's Space Oddity. When I heard that, I was just like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I would stay up late at night. I would wait until my parents went to bed, go back downstairs, turn on the TV, turn it down really low, sit 
three inches away from the screen to watch Don Kirshner's rock concert because then I would see Iggy and I would see Lou Reed and I would see David Bowie and just in awe and I was like that is what I want to be <laughs> that is all I ever want to be when I grow up is that <laughs> and that sort of stuck with me um, there was something about the artistry of what they were doing there was something about the theatrics of what they were doing and uh, I mean there was a some an element of like alienation that you didn't find in the other rock music but appealed to me as well. So then, you know, the punk rock came thing came along and I kind of identified with that. And that's what sort of led me into, you know, the music that we ended up sort of making. What was your very first album that you ever purchased? Um, the first albums that I purchased were very early, and they were Beatles. Um, because there were some albums that my brother didn't give a Beatles. He, he wasn't freaked out by and didn't give me it, but it's like I wanted them anyway, so that's where my Beatles album was. Started, but uh, you know, as I became a teenager, then you know, so I guess started getting into prog rock, very much into just the tall and the British folk, uh, folk rock scene, still and fairly, that kind of stuff as well. Um, and I do have, you know, I do have to admit that uh, Dennis Crawl, like he was more of an avid record than I was. And so he constantly was like, really, whatever was happening, whatever was new, you know, Dennis had. So I was borrowing records from him. You know, that's how I found um, a lot of the truth. That's a pure Hard to hear you. All right. Okay. If you must. If we must. <laughs> okay. So, tell me about the personalities that you've encountered. Um, there were a whole lot, you know. That, uh, like I said, Chris was there, and the early part of my music career that gave me the confidence to just sort of go for it and do it. I had a time when I was incredibly shy. <laughs> you know, um, but a lot of people, Randy Jones was sort of the, the big brother that, you know, the only way that my body ever was, that both artistically and sort of like in a very nurturing kind of sense, 
Yeah, I think we've been in cross the little paths with people who cross their feet to help me as a mom. But what I've noticed about you is every time you're in the forest, you then give back. So you have a teaching career now. You know, you know, and it, I mean, it's, it, it's definitely a very like, great thing to be a part of other people's Because there have been people who have been there for my years. And I'm trying to be mindful about it. And, you know, trying to be part of that in some way. But, you know, sort of when it comes down to it, it's like, with my students, it's like, it's their journey, it's their, they're the ones that are making it happen. If I can, you know, sort of be there to have confidence in them to help them along. That's one of them. But I'm not making anything. Mm -hmm. so They're the ones who are me a little bit of a picture of your world right now in the creative process that you're in. You know, the one thing, like, the, the older I get, um, taking, taking the time away from music and Focusing on artistic career was a really, really good thing. It allowed me to understand my own process. Now, I've learned to trust my instincts and to be patient. And that's a really hard thing to learn. You know, it's like, don't force anything. Just you know, it'll come um, just let like it happen. Because when I try and force things to happen, the outcome isn't nearly as good as when I just sort of give it the time and space that it needs. All, all of the songs, all of this body of work that we have, just happen on their own. You know, it's like they pretty much wrote themselves. I, tried to stay out of it, and would just, you know, it was more documenting what I was hearing in my head, and waiting for it to sort of fully work itself out, which, you know, in hindsight, I wish I could have done that in my 20s. I was going to ask you, compared to what you have before you, let's take a look back at some of these the, uh, to death. I mean, is there struggle in this? Not really, but, you know, back then, I, I didn't have the same kind of You know, I would, things were kind of rough. And I don't feel the need to do that anymore. I mean, these, a lot of these were, like, literally rough. Where, uh, especially in the Love Gods, Randy has got one of the founders of the New York Gods. It um, had taken a job in upstate New York. We knew he was leaving. And we had to rush him to the sea to capture what we had. We weren't ready for it. We weren't reversed enough. But it's like, if you don't get it done, you might be done. So we, you know, we just sort of did it anyway. Uh, and listening back to it, it's like I can tell that we weren't really quite, you know, prepared to do it. I mean, it's like, I'm proud of what we did. But, you know, it's like we had, with the bad CD, Glitter House had contacted us after the Deadly Spawn and the Flexi. We're like, we want to do a record, and they actually sent a check. There was an you know, airmail letter from Glitter House, which ended up being a huge German. They were the, ended up being the sole, sort of the European wing of sub pop records, like they had sold distribution of sub pop. Like, really big label. They really wanted to do, they heard the flexi disc, they were like, we love it, we want more here. 
here's the money. We want you to do it. So we're like, all right. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, 20, 22, 23? <laughs> That's hard. And it's like, okay. And we're like, all right, we'll, yeah, we'll do it. So, you know, we rushed into the studio before we were all ready you know, to do it. But we're like, oh, we had a couple more songs. So you go through this like, conscious creative process into the state of flow and so and it's just spilling out of you. How do you feel about that? Um, you know, I'm happy about, you know, it's sort of where things are right now. I understand myself, I understand my process. And I'm getting more and more comfortable with it. So, where do you plan to take the next step? Uh, when we get done here, we're sort of going back into recording mode. You know, for most of you guys probably don't know, but I haven't played in public in a long, long, long time. Um, for me, it's not that I don't enjoy it, but it's like I'm a homebody. I really like the comfort of, you know, sort of like the nesting and like the studio environment is where I feel completely comfortable. And in a lot of ways, the studio is like another instrument that you can play. And the recorded music is the thing that's going to last. It's the thing that's going to be around. In live performances, you know, sometimes they can be really great and the memories of it are really